is there a place in time where logic breaks down and wonderment begins? Could that be somewhere or sometime along an infinite line between the reasonable and the highly unlikely? Join us on a journey into the improbable. Today's story, episode 276, Poison, part one of two, read by Steve Peterson. Opening and closing theme by Matthew Erdman. Somewhere in some time, revenge might be a dish best served cold. My eyes roamed the skyline of New Vancouver, gaze settling on its shimmering glass and steel luxury condo towers. From my window I watched as delivery drones buzzed around them like a swarm of mosquitoes, packages from high-end retailers dangling from their insect-like carapaces containing things I could no longer afford. It was a painful reminder of what had been taken away from me when the AIs took over software development. More out of habit than hope, I turned to my desk terminal, opening up Cypher Investigation's social media stats. Only a few years ago, Cypher had been one of the most sought-after software companies in the Lower Mainland. However, only one person had visited the company's profile page in the past month. All I have left from those days is this single room that I can barely call an office, walls lined with shelves full of obsolete hardware, and a broken-down desk right in front of the window, which affords me a partial view of the glossy new city. In truth, my city view is only a distorted reflection in the cracked windows of the semi-abandoned, cheaply built late 20th century faux international-style office building across the street. And even this is at risk. A numbered company posted a redevelopment notice on the road last month, signaling that one of the city's last affordable areas would soon become a forest of overpriced condo towers. Judging from the people I meet in the washroom every morning trying to conceal toothbrushes, I know I'm not the only person living in their office. My name is Will Cipher, founder, CEO, and currently sole employee of Cipher Investigations, formerly Cipher Software Systems. Exactly five years ago, facing foreclosure after running through all my savings, I was forced to throw in the towel, let everyone go, and go into survival mode. Then, like so many others these days, I started looking around for something else to do, something the AIs would never be good at. Feeling sorry for me, a former client gave me a gig to track down the bad actor who was holding a friend's personal data ransom. After that, Cypher Systems became Cypher Investigations. Even my new field is under threat by AI, so my clients tend to be people who don't trust machines, and those are getting fewer and farther between. There was a knock at the door, which shook me out of my funk. The knock was odd, because the front door of this building requires visitors to call up, and no one comes to this part of the city unless they absolutely need to. I do my best to ignore the former, so I don't have to deal with the latter, which is most likely someone from a collection agency. Yes, collection agencies are one of the few sectors that still use people to deal with those of us who, through no fault of our own, find ourselves having to catch up on payments. I assume some AI had noticed that human collectors had a higher success rate than their robotic counterparts. By law, a non-industrial robot's strength is limited to that of a six-year-old human, and their top speed is capped at five kilometers per hour, making them easy to outrun. I ignored the knock, which only made the knocker more determined. There's no one here, I finally said in as irritated a tone as I could muster. Are you Will Cipher, the private eye? A woman on the other side of the door inquired. Go away, I growled. I've got something I'd like you to investigate, she claimed. That caught my attention. Still suspicious, I slowly got up and sauntered to the door, half hoping the woman would go away before I got there. I opened it as far as the security chain allowed, glimpsing into the grease-stained hallway. I was about to slam the door closed when a sharply dressed woman with an air of professionalism that made the hall look even shabbier than it was blocked my view and stared back. How'd you find out about me? I probed anxiously, trying to decide if this was a new tactic one of my pals at the collection agency had dreamed up. 
I found your profile online and your ratings were good, all five stars, the woman added. I had spent hours creating fake accounts to make those recommendations, so this woman could be my sole visitor. When were you on my company page? Still unconvinced, I challenged through the crack between the door and the frame. About a week ago, I remembered your development company. It did some work for us once. And then you hired an AI and got rid of us, I concluded. What do you want? Your unique skills as an investigator and software developer. I have a job for you. The word job was like candy to my ears, but I was still wary. Hesitantly, I unchained the door. The woman walked through without waiting to be invited in, dusted off my chair, and took up residence behind my desk. It was the only place to sit other than the futon I kept rolled up in one corner. She sniffed the air as if something had gone bad, which was possible. City bylaws forced residents of this area to only take garbage outside to the bins on collection days. Today wasn't one of them. I closed the door and leaned against the wall. Before you get all settled in, I groused. Tell me about it. The woman eyed my rolled-up futon. I can see business hasn't been so good. I don't think you'll want to turn this down. I'll turn down what I want to, I threatened. But she was right. I was desperate and right now would do just about anything. I had even tried collecting bottles and cans, only to discover I was competing against fleets of robotic recyclers owned by a large global waste management company. The greedy things constantly swept the streets and lanes, leaving nothing for the desperate locals to scour. I couldn't afford to turn down a job. There was only one more missed rent payment between the street and me, and as of a few moments ago, I didn't have it. I'm Marta Hetman, the woman informed me as if that should mean something to me. When I didn't react, she added, I'm the chief technology officer at the Security Exchange Administration. You'll be working undercover as one of our systems analysts. The exchange replaced everyone with AIs five years ago, I pointed out sarcastically. At least that's what your predecessor told me when they didn't renew Cypher's contract. Is this buyer's remorse, or are you just doing charity for PR? The mighty exchange helps down and out former contractor or something like that. The exchange had been one of Cypher's largest clients, and losing that contract was the final straw that broke the camel's back. At the time, I had been so mad I was ready to sue, but it was pointless. A couple of years earlier, delivery drivers had created a class action suit to hold back the rollout of autonomous vans, but no court would look at their case. We were both on the wrong side of history. Don't get me wrong, I don't hold it against anyone. I don't hate AIs either. I used to develop them before they began to take over that as well. Marta Hetman nodded thoughtfully. We didn't lay off everyone. The old school contingent in the C-suite doesn't entirely trust AIs. So we compromised and kept a few warm bodies around to ease their anxiety. It makes them feel they still have control. We're going to plant you in that unit. It will give you a reason to poke around in our systems. Cypher could have provided those bodies, I growled, momentarily failing to tamp my anger down. I needed the job and told my rage to take a big slice of humble pie. The woman shrugged. I don't know how that decision was made. I wasn't there then, but I'm here now. She explained that there had recently been a suspicious, catastrophic crash in the stock market, which should never have happened. The exchange's AIs had failed to come up with an explanation. Marta reasoned that if the problem had been one of the automated systems, asking those same systems to find faults with themselves would be like asking a sociopath to admit they were manipulating the people around them to get their way. She suspected a bad actor had somehow hacked in and changed something, but she couldn't figure out how they would have benefited from the crash. Shorting had also been negatively affected, so everyone had lost out. I came to you because your old company helped develop parts of the current automated exchange system, she explained. If we go to the authorities, this will be all over the news. People will lose confidence in the exchange, and we can't afford to let that happen. So, we want to quietly figure out what went wrong and prevent it from occurring again. Your skill set and familiarity with the exchange, Mr. Cipher, make you uniquely qualified to do this. All our communications will need to be off the record, Martha explained, handing me a pair of earbuds. 
If we can't talk face to face, use those. They don't run through the net. Analog radio, I guess? Sure, if that's how you want to think about it. The important bit is they're offline. The woman smiled knowingly, then walked out. Exactly a week later, I was sitting in a windowless, semi abandoned antiseptic cubicle farm, logging into the exchange trading system's back end. Only three of us were in the cave like space, strategically separated by several rows to discourage interaction. It seemed like a pointless measure. I doubted we would ever become besties. The place was more depressing than my shabby office. At least my office had a visible history of human occupation in the food stained carpet and marked up walls. Here, the cleaning bots sterilize everything daily, so the room always smells new and unused. The human resources AI had introduced us through the corporate handhelds we had all been issued. The things were so laden with trackers that I began to appreciate why Marta had given me the earbud radios. George, who looked like he was biding his time to retirement, didn't even look up from his terminal. Mars looked like they had been recruited right out of high school and greeted me with a terse smile that said they were not happy I was there. Fortunately, I wouldn't have much to do with either, and for the first time, I felt that being replaced by a machine had probably been better than working for years in this sterile office graveyard. I'm in, I subvocalized to my earbuds. Good, Martha replied through static, which made me wonder what the range of the earbuds was, then added, I'd suggest starting by analyzing all the programmatic trades leading up to the crash. That's a tall order, I whispered, checking to see if my human pals could hear me. They couldn't, or at least didn't appear to. Damn it, I'm a programmer, not an AI, I joked. I can't brute force this. I'll look for outliers instead. Marta greeted my Star Trek reference with silence. She obviously had no sense of humor, or was not a fan of old sci-fi. Taking her lack of response as a yes to my plan, I opened the transaction records. It was a daunting labyrinth of data streams, but my instincts kicked in, guiding me through the intricate maze. As I sifted through the digital debris left by the crash, a pattern emerged, a trail of irrational trades that defied market logic. It was as if some insane investor had rampaged through the exchange, making ludicrous trades. On the surface, the transactions looked like they came from different accounts. However, they were too coordinated for multiple AIs to be involved. Through a convoluted network of ownership, I finally tracked the accounts to a single automated trading system. And from there, hidden behind layers of security, I found a company I had never heard of, which had developed and trained the misbehaving AI. Any idea what happened? Marta asked, picking at her doses. We had arranged to meet at a food cart several blocks from the exchange building. We didn't know if the problem was internal, and the exchange's AIs, which could be the cause, recorded everything said in the building. I waited until a group of tourists who suspiciously appeared out of nowhere took their orders and left, passing out of earshot. It looks like a coordinated attack on the automated investment system, I said, pausing for emphasis. It was too precise for it to be a random event. I found the automated trader responsible for the irrational transactions, leading me to a company called Larissa AI Solutions. They originally developed and trained the AI sometime after Cypher's contract ended. I glared accusingly at Marta. She held up a hand to stop me before I belabored the point. Again, I had nothing to do with that, she said defensively. Larissa AI Solutions? I've never heard of them. Neither have I, I admitted, taking a bite of my falafel. Larissa's AI had been working perfectly for years, and they didn't push an update to the core program before the crash, which would tend to point to data poisoning. If the exchange's systems are still doing routine learning by consuming public market data, the attack could have come from anywhere, including Larissa or even someone inside the exchange. All they would need to know is which public data repositories your systems use. It would only take one or two percent of it to be tainted to cause the erratic behavior. Marta nodded. You'll need to confirm that. I'll keep digging, I agreed, taking another bite of my falafel. But we need to be careful. We don't want the perpetrators to know we're on to them. They may try to cover their tracks. I didn't tell Marta that if it was anyone worth their salt, they would have erased any evidence before the attack occurred. 
so I'd probably spend hours looking and come up with nothing. However, I wanted to string this gig out as long as I could. I needed the cash. When I returned to the nearly abandoned cubicle farm I was affectionately thinking of as the graveyard, Mars and the other analyst were gone, presumably to lunch. While a superficial glance at my desk might leave the impression I just randomly dropped stuff anywhere and then forgot about it, the truth is quite different. Although my organizational style might appear chaotic, it is in fact precise and intentional. I, and only I, can tell if something has been changed which was how I noticed someone had been in my cubicle. My shoulder bag, which generally sported receipts, printouts, and empty candy wrappers escaping from its pockets, hung over the back of my chair, looking decidedly too neat. Someone had gone through it. I slid into my chair, signed into the terminal, and checked its logs. Whoever had been there hadn't broken into my computer. They wouldn't have found anything in my bag to blow my cover, but why would someone have gone through it in the first place? Petty thievery? I doubted that was the motivation. I'd need to be more careful. Putting the incident aside for the moment, I began looking for more information on Larissa AI Solutions. Getting nowhere, I decided to look for any news about the company, but it quickly became clear someone had gone to a lot of trouble to sanitize any mention of Larissa. However, no company is ever that clean. There are always rumors, gossip, or bits and pieces of complaints that go against the shiny corporate story. But there was nothing. I was left with little more than a few scattered mentions. After an hour or so of digging through these, I eventually found what I was looking for. It was an email from an obscure dark web data market that I bought at a discount because of its age and lack of interest. The message described a class action lawsuit against Larissa AI Solutions over their software used by police to identify criminals. It appeared that innocent people were misidentified, arrested, and imprisoned based on the AI's faulty decisions. The plaintiffs argued that Larissa failed to test their AI before deployment and had no plan in place for recourse should errors occur, but Larissa denied culpability and hired a cadre of high-priced legal AIs who countered sued for reputational damage. The case was dropped and there were hints of some kind of off-the-book settlement. After, a judicial AI ordered the removal of all online content referring to the case and the accusations. But you can never entirely remove something from the web. There's always some obscure enclave that escapes attention, and I'd been lucky enough to find it. Hey, new guy. I jumped and turned to find Mars Muller smugly looking like a cat who had just eaten a bird leaning against the back of my cubicle. How long have you been standing there shoulder surfing? I demanded, trying not to sound concerned. Long enough to know you're not working, he gloated. Hey, don't worry, I understand. We all have hobbies. There's not a lot to do around here. The AIs take care of almost everything. We're just window dressing for the C-suite. It makes them feel more secure. But if something goes wrong, there's not much we can do other than run to the data center and pull the plug. I have a pair of insulated wire cutters beside my desk, he laughed. So I guess you weren't fast enough when that major market crash recently happened, I joked, hoping to get under his skin and trigger an unintended response. Who do you think stopped it, he boasted, snipping the air with his fingers. Proved our worth to the people upstairs that day. Well, actually, George did, he admitted. The old guy got the entire trading system offline before the exchange hit zero points. I was on lunch but the team got the credit, and I'll take credit wherever I can. I knew Mars' type. Young, cocky, bored, and nosy. He was going to be a problem, and maybe already was, if he had been standing behind me for any significant length of time. That's good to know, I said, pasting on my best fake smile. If I need help, I'll talk to George. Mars made a face and left. Playing it safe, I pretended to knock off early and went home to continue my research. I trudged up the stairs to my office and found the tiny piece of paper I had placed between the door and the frame lying on the hallway floor. My heart rate began to race as I pulled out my cell phone and checked the building's entry requests. Apart from a few of the usual suspects, some unemployed building residents and the occasional delivery bot, nobody had been in or out. 
That insignificant shred of paper had recorded something missed by the building's security software. Someone had broken into my space. With a trembling hand, I reached for the doorknob and carefully opened it. Inching inside, I blindly felt along the wall for the light switch while fear rose in my throat like bile. I hadn't been in a physical fight before and certainly wasn't prepared for one. All my experience dealing with cybercriminals had left me ill-equipped for this kind of confrontation. Suddenly I heard a sound coming from within the shadows, followed by movement, and something lunged toward me. To be continued. You can help us continue creating original content twice a month by either heading over to ko-fi.com slash makeshift stories and making a one-time donation or becoming an ongoing supporter at patreon.com slash makeshift stories. Makeshift stories is released around the beginning and middle of the month. This month's story was written by Alan V. Hare and read by Steve Peterson. Opening and closing themes were composed and recorded by Matthew Erdman. Audio production and editing by Makeshift Studios. If you'd like to connect with us, please send an email to makeshiftstories at gmail.com or visit our website at makeshiftstories.com. Makeshift Stories is released under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution, no derivative license, which means you are free to share our stories. Just remember to credit us and don't alter anything. <laughs>